Professor Sam Kularatna, and he is uh, the Chair Professor of Medicine of the Department of Medicine in University of Prairie Denia. And he's a dynamic personality, he's a great clinician, a respected teacher, an uh, outstanding researcher, and as well as gifted author. We are very glad to have you here, sir, for the event. Without taking much uh, time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Arusha Disanayak, the President, Ceylon College of Physician, to welcome our speaker for the event. Over to you, sir. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Uh, I, I hope uh, you can hear me well. Uh, you may not see me very well. Uh, I, there is a power interruption and I'm trying to make myself visible uh, with a candle. But of course, this is a spirit. Uh, when I, in my presidential induction address, I spoke about the need for resilience uh, on behalf of us, resilience on behalf of us. And then um, resilience is our ability to thrive in adversity. And now we have to face up to it. And we are doing that. I mean, we are not going to stop any of the CCP activities just because there is a power interruption or any other matter, we will go on. I'm reminded of, you know, the Second World War, uh, London didn't have any electricity. Everybody was in the in dark. And then, of course, they had a very inspiring prime minister who said, Mr. Churchill said, we will fight on the beaches, on the landing grounds, on the hills, on the streets, on the fields, and we will never surrender. So it's the same spirit that we are carrying on with the CCP. Uh, I will keep very short, Professor Kuluratna, on a personal note. He's a man whom I admire very much, who has done some fantastic research, a true Sri Lankan researcher who built a fabulous research career on his own effort. He's an inspiration to all of us. He's a fantastic uh, clinician, and I've had the privilege of being his co-examiner at the MD, and I found him one of the most organized and methodical examiners. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kulratna, thank you, Anush, for organizing this. Thank you, the CCP uh, Book Club team, for organizing this. And a warm welcome to all the people in the audience for joining this uh, here and later on on YouTube as well. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, without taking much time, I would like to invite now our speaker today, Professor Sam Kularatna, uh, to speak to us about the book the book that uh, uh, inspired him, A Bitter Berry Bondage. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. So uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, President of CCP, Professor Ashley Sanayake, and Dr. Madhuanti Hetiarachi, I mean, to invite me to join this uh, book club with today's presentation. And uh, in fact, Madhuanti reminded me many times. And uh, three weeks ago, when she uh, told me that I had to do it, then I was thinking, uh, what should I uh, present? Uh, because during the last two years or so, I have read about 20 books. Huh? Then uh, I thought a uh, lot of books are not related to medicine, but to do something related to medicine is more amicable we felt, and I sent this uh, picture to Madhuan to select what is necessary for the CCP. Then only she selected this book, Bitter Berry Bondage. Right. Uh, this is the book I, I am going to introduce and uh, uh, share with you. And uh, in fact, uh, this book was introduced to me by one of my friends. Uh, he's a, he's a batch of, uh, batchmate of mine, uh, Dr. Aryavan, so he's a radiologist, consult radiologist, and uh, he's also an avid reader. And he said, uh, there's a good book called Bitterbury Bondage by Donovan Moldrich. He did not say what the book is and what about it. And then I had a uh, inquisitive to find this book and I trace it and bought it. So this is the date actually I bought it in uh, 2018. 
July 20th. So I used to, I have the practice to actually put the date and the signature of mine whenever I buy a book. So once I uh, got the book, then I read the outer cover in detail. It says 19th century coffee workers of Sri Lanka. So I felt actually I found the book I wanted because I got interested about uh, this, uh, our fellow countrymen, they are the, the upcountry Tamil people about their history and uh, their contribution to the country. Why I got really interested because I was a physician at uh, Navalapitiya in 1992, 91 to 94, about three years. And during that time, uh, most of my patients were coming from the estates, estate uh, up country, Tamil people. And I met one Tamil gentleman called Mr. Rajagopalan. He's a freelance writer. And, uh, actually, he had a good command in English. And we got uh, befriended and he was very helpful to me. And he was actually helping me with my Tamil language. So it was customary that in all of your hospital, uh, without fluency in Tamil, difficult to go around. But the uh, interesting thing is uh, the, the doing a word round is very simple during that time in novel Pithia because uh, within an hour or two, you can finish both words. Most of the medical problems are very trivial among these uh, patients. Very few problems, infections, some infections, diarrheal diseases, anemia, or some alcohol problems. Those are the problems. No ischemic heart disease, right? Uh, not many strokes, uh, less this uh, non-communicable disease. That's what my experience uh, in now living here, mainly the infections. I mean, this is an entirely different story. When I went to Auradhapura, where I served as a physician for five years, that was actually doing a vote round is a marathon. Anyway, coming back to the, the, this book, so I got interested about this uh, subject. And uh, I started reading, usually I start reading uh, the book from the back cover and uh, the, the uh, forward and all those things to start with. So I, show, uh, I want to just share with you some messages in the back cover because those who have read, they have uh, given some statements, right? So the death, uh, the, the first, uh, one says, Alan said, the master took off the deceased clothes and kicked him in the private parts. This is past what an extremement. Pickenton had then called bungalow servants and told him the dog is shaving, remove him to the veranda and pour water on him. And the other one is, that is the thick black streak that darkens the pages of this book. Coffee workers came to Ceylon with their chattels in the hope of escaping the grinding poverty in which they lived in South India. But for many of them, at the time, one in four, Ceylon became their charnel house. Charnel house means their death house. If history is delayed justice, then the verdict of uh, guilty have to be entered against most of the governors of Ceylon in the coffee period and the kankanis and the planters. Even the nature was cruel to the coffee workers. Death wrote in the frail craft in which they faced hazards of backwater. It was only a step behind the workers on the very 150 mile walk from hot and arid plains of northwestern province of Ceylon to the cold and well hillsides of the coffee states. Death struck in the shape of a slithering snake in the undergrowth or through the clothes and jaws of man eating leopard. So, 
these are the, the actually things, the essence we get from this book, from the readers. So this book really is on coffee workers during 19th century and their misery, their plight. So I, just, I would like to talk about the author. Author is Donovan Mulrich. And he published this book in 12th January, 1988. Mulrich says, genesis of this book started in 1950. Because during that time, the Mulrich was the labor reporter of Times of Ceylon. He had association with the Ceylon Workers' Congress. So that has his uh, headquarters in Naval City during that time. So he befriended with two uh, uh, gentlemen from that uh, uh, community, Mr. Velu Pille, the MP Talavakale, and Mr. Vilayan. By that time, Mr. Vilayan has written a book and published that name is Born to uh, Labor. So reading that book that has moved the Moldrich and he moved, that book has moved him to tears. After that, he started researching on the estate workers during that time in 1950s. During that time, it was not coffee, it was tea. So he was meeting millions of estate workers, according to him, going from one estate to another. And in 1950s, there was an issue of giving citizenship to the estate workers in Sri Lanka. So there was a battle going on. So he was, that was the actual initiation of his thought about writing something on the topic, born in Ceylon to die in India, because these people had to go to India because they didn't have citizenship in Sri Lanka. So that was the seeding idea of this book. Then he uh, wrote, in the years that followed, as I devolved into roots of the tea workers, then a small, built, slim, slight, shadowy figure emerged from the mist of time. I mean, he, I mean, the, this uh, uh, Mulrich has a good command in English. I mean, it's interesting to read his way of writing. I mean, I mean, he saw a figure that is actually emerging from the mist of time. That means he was actually looking through the past. Then the coffee worker came to his mind. So the coffee worker means born in India to die in Ceylon. So opposite of born in Ceylon to die in India, so it became born in India to die in Ceylon, in coffee workers. So then by that time, the Mulrich has become new editor of Time of Work Ceylon. And he started doing his uh, research on these uh, coffee workers. And apparently it has taken almost 30 years by the time he produced this book. So that is the importance of it. So these are the bibliography of work cited uh, by Moderich. I mean, in his book, there are 57 pages carrying the bibliography, reference to all kinds of reports, books, and so on, right? So average number of references come to about in the 855. I did not count very much, but around that figure. So all this, I mean, the, 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 these are very researched uh, uh, book. Hmm? I mean, that is based on the facts, not, not any fiction, it's based on facts because he has, uh, he is actually, he has cited so many letters, communications in the colonial uh, government 
governors, then the, the colonial secretary, then the planters, then the uh, all kinds of other people. There are so many things he has gone into to get the content of it. Then who is this Donovan Mulrich? I could not find about him because the, he, he doesn't write any details about him very much, but he has devoted this book to his brother. Unfortunately, by the time of uh, publication, his brother has passed away. So actually, then it was uh, 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 he writes that uh, my brother knew uh, knew of the dedication of the book to him, but uh, did not live to see it in its present form. I now take the opportunity also to dedicate in the book to Gladia, who was my brother's devoted wife for the 35 years and their children. Then, uh, then the foreword of this uh, book was written, is written by one Paul Casper. He writes in this foreword something very interesting. He writes in the first line of this, uh, uh, in the first line of his introduction, the author avers his story needed to be told. That's what the introduction starts. Then the Ian Guntileka is the, the librarian in Peradini New City. Then the, the whole Casper right, Ian told me of Donovan's excellence and his quest for some, uh, someone to finance. So Donovan is actually looking for publication of his book. Then it did not take me long to decide that I would do all. So this Paul Casper took the initiative to finance and publish it. That's how this book has come. So coming to the content of the book, the first uh, chapter is when King uh, Kofi Green Candy, the rise and fall of the coffee industry. Myth mythology of the lazy native, why foreign uh, labor was needed. Assign a song for China, attempt to import Chinese labor to Silo. Push and pull factor, why millions of Indians came to Silo. Let's talk the silo attack, disaster at sea. Slimy snakes and the hungry leopard, hazards of 150 miles walk to the estate. Master and servant and the men in between. Labor legislation of the coffee period. Jolly jolly, sixpence and the rice and curry word too. Wage structure of the coffee estate. Give me my beef, repression and Resistance of the coffee states. Men without women, women, bleeding statistics. Social life on the plantation, food, housing, education, religion, caste. Cartload of skulls, mortality in the growth year of the coffee industry. It's a, it's a cartload of skull, skulls. That implies the plight of these people. Found dead, cause unknown. Mortality in the boom years. Into hospital to die. Mortality in the twilight years of the uh, coffee, coffee industry. So this is the content, contents of the book. And the Moldrich has uh, heavily cited a lot of literature and enrich the content of this book. It need a lot of concentration uh, to read it. And about two years ago, I read this book uh, as it was available to me. But uh, uh, when uh, Madhuvanti told me that to do it, I had to uh, go through it again hurriedly uh, during this MD 
period <laughs> where I had to uh, do a lot of work for this in the exam. Uh, it was over uh, uh, this week. So come to introduction. I uh, hope you could see what the Moldrich start this introduction. This is the story that need to be told. Throughout the present century, Ceylon has been renowned for its tea. On 22nd May 1972, Ceylon was officially renamed Sri Lanka. But as cash matter, more than the sentiments of the country's main foreign exchange, earners continue to be marketed as Ceylon tea. Until independence on 4th February 1948, in the decades that followed, Ceylon image abroad has been that of Tommy's Lipton Tea Garden. The legend nurtured by Chauvinist British journalist and writer that was Tommy Lipton, the grocer's boy from Glasgow, came to Ceylon in the last century and said, we could grow tea here and did so very successfully. Then the last line is very interesting. The sun has now set both on the British Empire and on Lipton Empire, uh, within the empire. But Ceylon and the tea remain synonymous. So that was a very catching introduction uh, by Mulrich. This introduction is actually very lengthy introduction because he is going through all the chapters in detail. Uh, actually, one came to Silva, he's a Sri Lankan historian. Uh, he writes, while the movements of Indian immigrants labor to West Indies and Mauritius has been the subject of several books and the monograph, particularly by students seeking to show development of the concepts of imperial trusteeship, movements in Ceylon has been curiously neglected. It's correct. It's very correct. Because there's not much thing written about the, the subject, the coffee period, and about the, the workers, Indian migrants, workers, there's nothing very much. Because of that reason, this more rich book has a greater value. Then it further says, the Ramasami. So all these men who came were called Ramasami by the planters, and the females were called Meenachi. And these uh, planters actually, in their communication, they use very derogatory uh, terms about these people. Ramasami was a generic name applied to the Indian coffee workers by the coffee planters, just as the cotton truckers on the southern state of America was known as Sambo. In physical appearance, the coffee workers was described by Dr. W. R. N. Kinsey, principal civil medical officer, as a thin, wary men with slight muscular development and no superfluous uh, super pattern, about five feet, six inches in height, and weight, weight average about 150 to 110 pounds. Then something very derogatory uh, written by Dr. W. Wendot about uh, he was a Ceylon surgeon, and this is what he wrote. As met with Cil uh, Ceylon, they are of middling stature, and slender make, being more witty and sinewy, sinewy and robust or muscular. Their complexion varies from dusky brown to tawny black, but is rarely or never light or uh, brunette, a variety so common in other Indian races. These features are molded on the Caucasian type and though seldom, Preferably, uh, perfectly regu regular are not uh, regular are not usually ugly or repulsive. The skull shows greater deficiency in the intellectual or moral religion, but the seat of animal fashion is on the other hand 
abnormality developed. The eyes are dark, but won't think in depth of animation with small sluggish pupil. Rather narrow, fore, narrow forehead, wide than prominent cheekbone, full and slightly hung up lower lip. So these are actually the, 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 all kinds of description given by these colonial people during that time. So this Moorish actually uh, 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 used to quote uh, this uh, separately. However, there's a, uh, I could not insert another slide here. That uh, slide uh, about the Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin has written something actually good about these Indian workers who are work who are working in Mauritius and the uh, other countries. But he did not visit Sri Lanka. So the rest of the chapters. The first chapter is the King Coffee, theme in candy rise and fall of the coffee industry. So the, the, the content of this page is basically the uh, coffee, how coffee was introduced to uh, Sri Lanka. So I mean, this introduction of coffee to Sri Lanka is linked, uh, has linked to the, the colonial governors to start with Ed, Edward Barnes. And by about uh, uh, 1830, coffee industry has established in Sri Lanka in the up country. And it was flourishing in Kandy, in up country. And by about uh, 1869, there's a fungus called coffee uh, crust that appeared and the coffee industry died by about mid 1880. So that was what that was that has happened to coffee, but it was the major export. And and to, to work in this coffee industry, the colonial uh, rulers, as well as the planters, wanted people coming from India, South India. Because there was a saying, um, that's called mythology, lazy, lazy, lazy natives. Uh, so this book has a long, lengthy discussion whether the Sri Lankan or Sinhalese were lazy people during that time, right? But uh, different authors uh, used, to write, uh, used to write in a different view why Sinhalese people did not, or Sri Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan people during that time did not take up to work in the uh, coffee state. Then uh, these planters and the uh, colonial government they tried to get down Chinese people to work in the coffee states, but then they compared Chinese people and the South Indian workers, they felt South Indian workers are, are better because they won't make very much demand, trouble. They are very much actually uh, obeying the masters. So they were comparing this. Ota was comparing the, these uh, coffee workers with the slaves, African slaves who were working in the, the North America. So the South Indian uh, workers are not really slaves. They were not slaves. So they were paid people who have come to Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon, and after working a few years, they have returned. So they came to, to do a job. But when they were doing work in this, uh, this coffee plantation, it was really slavery because there was no what is called human rights, according to that. So when it started in 1830 or so, the most of these colonial uh, masters and the planters, they are very inhumane and they ill-treated these people very much. So that contributed for their debt. No uh, law for these debts. When there's a debt happens, there's no, uh, nobody responsible. But as the time passes, when it comes to, towards the latter part of COVID period, 
uh, the things have improved a bit and the counters and the the government has become more concerned about these people because uh, they needed these people uh, so that's how things have changed push and pull factors why million of indians came to silo so as i said uh, there are problems in south india because the south india is living is very difficult so th because of that those people prefer to come to uh, silon during that time so in the book there are a lot of uh, cited accounts about that so that was the very reason they have come to silon when they were coming to silon there were disasters at sea because there were boats they were overcrowded in these boats sometime those boat capsized and people died in in india south india there were people called these kankanis they are the representative of planters they are, they were the people actually good the people and prompted them to come to the silon uh, but when these people were coming they don't know what will happen to them and most of the people about 25% of the people did not have a chance to go back because they have died to uh, died on the way after coming to silon then uh, initially uh, these migrants workers came to mena from mena they have taken the 150 mile walk by foot right to reach uh, estates so mena to medavachi medavachi to amradapur then on the way to uh, matali that's how they came it was 150 mile Walk. So that was very hazardous walk. Be be because of that, uh, to facilitate, uh, give some facilitate, 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 facilitation. So the the some hospital came up along this road uh, route later. For example, Madhavachi Hospital, Mihintali Hospital, all came up. Our other hospital all came up as a result of. this uh, co uh, workers coming from india there was another road going from uh, mena to uh, putlam then to putlam to kurunagala and to matali so the another route and later in 9, 1860 when the trains operating then they were they came to kalambu and took a uh, train to uh, estate so that's how it has evolved i mean then there are a lot of details you can read about uh, labor legislation uh, of this period then the wage structures then the rep uh, repression and resistance of coffee workers how they were beaten how they were killed all were there in the book men without women uh, most of the people who came is workers for men and few women and children so Uh, there was no marriage as such so there are a lot of social issues among them and uh, coming to the housing uh, as it is now they have this line house even the author says nobody could trace why those were called line but the description of line is the same as today so these people had religion and they had different caste system etc so what is important medically was the deaths happening in these people so it is true that uh, during that time in uh, early 1830s 1840s the, there are so many skulls by the right uh, by the sides of the road there are uh, shiny skulls so that's why i say cart loads of skulls so a lot of people have died and they were by the side of the roads 
and they were both, both the bodies have decayed and the bones were left. So that was the plight of these people on the way to states. Once they came to stay, uh, coffee state, they are also, when they are sick and ill, sometimes they are ill-treated and when they can't, uh, could not work, uh, do any work, they push back to the street. They also, they used to die. So like that, there are many people died. So the death, uh, all those, the, the statistics says about 25% of uh, those who came died uh, likewise. So one of the commonest cause of death was cholera infection. So cholera was rampant in this uh, time during estates. So they have died on the way due to cholera. After coming to estates, also they have died due to cholera. So these planters, they were the, uh, I mean, they are non-medical, but they were the people treating these uh, uh, sick people with cholera, with all kinds of things. And there's one plant he has said, he has used arsenic to treat this patient. So when, you, when he's uh, trying to identify the dose of arsenic needed to treat cholera, there were 30 pe uh, people died due to arsenic toxicity. So those are the kind of uh, experiment they have done. So it is, uh, uh, it, it was, uh, very, those are very serious issues, but uh, nothing has happened during that time. So uh, likewise, a uh, lot of things uh, include uh, in the book uh, about the, uh, the mortality figures, as well as the, the cholera, then the smallpox, the dysenteries. Uh, some medical aspects are described uh, uh, by the monolith in this book. Then, uh, then uh, the hospital, latter part of uh, 1800, uh, 1800, there were hospitals available in the estate areas like Nawal, Pitya, Kandy. Those hospitals have come up. But very seldom these people were coming to hospital because these planters were not actually sending their sick people to hospital. So they just treat, treated them and they just died. But uh, according to statics, uh, when they came to his hospital, most of the people were moribund, and even in the hospital they have died because during that time, no antibiotics, no uh, advanced medical treatment. So, uh, so the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, this is what actually I have to, uh, I could share with you uh, during this uh, given time. And uh, again, Sorry for my delay, and it took almost uh, 20, uh, 40 minutes for me to do this presentation. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that great uh, presentation. Actually, you took us, all, I think we, you took us all to, for, uh, to a different world in the history of almost a century ago. Uh, and uh, we think that this is a difficult time for all of us. And, uh, listening to your story, listening to your book, uh, you have read, uh, uh, we feel that we are not having a difficult time at all, actually. So uh, the forum is open for the discussion now. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's a comment from uh, Fernando in that you have motivated her to read the book. I think you have motivated. Uh, I think, uh, the, I mean, all of us tend to kind of forget the coffee period of Sri Lanka, uh, yes. which. Uh, which uh, was it about three decades, uh, like started in the 1840s, is it, sir? And then ended yeah. in 1870s or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, it, 1830s like and the time period, eight, right? 
Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, so, uh, and then we, we also got, I, I can't now recall the book, sir, but I read the book, I'm trying to remember which book it was, uh, about this journey from Matotavara, at least mm -hmm. if they come from Matt. I can't hear you, sir, clearly. Uh, yeah, can't hear you. Come down from Mena and then from Mena to uh, Hill Country. Yes. So many people who had communicated, you know, either make bites and uh, all leopards, leopards, etc. So uh, that itself, uh, we can search in detail about how dangerous. Yeah, I mean the this book. Uh, I mean the, all these details are there. Uh, I mean it need uh, very patient reading. Uh, uh, and it takes uh, time to absorb the whole content. Mm. Yeah, it seems to record uh, a bit of history which uh, seems to have been lost along the way, which yeah. is so very important. And uh, and very rightly you said that though they were not slaves, but because yes. they were paid. But from yes. what I understand, sir, they were, uh, they, were, they were so indebted to their masters here. There was no yes. way they were going to get enough money and get back to India. Though they yes. came to, get to India, they yes. just would live here. Yes. And uh, so, and they got citizenship with the Sirima Shastri Pact, means, sir. That was, correct, uh, correct, yes. Correct, the yes. Sirima Shastri Pact, they got that. Ne? Yes. Okay, yes. sir, thank you. So much. I mean, it has been a real uh, eye opener. I mean, I really want to read this book. So, did you buy this book in Sri Lanka? Yes, yes. It was available in Sarasavi Bookshop. I bought it from Sarasavi. All right. I think it has oh. a less demand, I suppose. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, this is uh, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I, I think so. Coffee plantation workers who came from uh, India. Yes. Are they like uh, the, the subsequently like the people came from for tea plantation as well? So are they of the same lineage or are they different? Like same same lineage, same lineage. If continued from coffee to tea, is the same thing continued. Continued. Yeah. So uh, so people came after two to three years. They have gone back back again. They have come back. So like that, uh, the two and fro happening, and some people settle down, right? So by 1960s or so, 50s, 60s, this issue came, right? So, Giving citizenship. So like uh, for coffee plantation, now according to this book, it was uh, mostly men who came, but yes, yes. Uh, tea plantations, like the workers, like uh, there were a lot of women. So uh, probably later. Uh, the women, more women would have joined the labor force. So, yeah, probably also, I mean, then a lot of actually children are born in this country, you know, right? Then the probably okay. the number of females increase yeah. with time, yes. Right. Following on on that, sir, I mean, I don't know about the eighties question, I'm just wondering, yes. were the tasks in a, in a coffee uh, plantation Yes. more suited to men than the tasks in a, a tea plantation. I, I don't know. I'm just asking I you. Also, uh, yes. like I was thinking in the same lines, Arosha. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, pr probably, actually, I mean, the, the coffee, of course, they have to pluck the seeds. No, I mean, the coffee seeds, so they say uh, this uh, seeding time was uh, November to February like. So the higher demand was during that time. Right, but the the tea, of course, is different way of plugging. So the, probably those would have contributed. All right, thank you very much, sir, again uh, for joining us today and give us that great talk uh, for the night. And uh, uh, I think we'll be meeting again in next uh, book club in uh, one month's time. Thank you very much, sir, again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will certainly join for the next book club. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Much. And thank you all for joining us.
write a good night to everybody good night uh, thank good you night. again and may i invite more people to join the book club and volunteer to talk about a book which inspired them made them better and you know which which all of us can actually learn from thank you very much good okay night. thank you very much professor right right bye